Greetings. A while ago, I did a video which was originally titled Debunking the Protection Dog Excuse, and this one will be a follow-up to that production. But first, I just got a great comment from a subscriber, and I feel compelled to share it. It reads as follows. Dog lovers don't like facts because they refuse to see what's true. They don't, for example, want to believe that dogs' paws really contain bacteria and sometimes even fungus, or that a dog's saliva really can cause a serious infection to a person if the dog licks the person's wound. There are videos and news reports about those subjects, but dog lovers don't watch or read them. Why do I mention this? Well, it seems that there is nothing dog defenders will accept as valid criticism of dogs. But before moving on, I would like to present a thought experiment. First, I will just say the following. If dogs weren't a problem in and of themselves, there would be nothing wrong with owning them. Pause and ponder that one for a minute or two. I say this because to be sure, the dog owner does share in some of the responsibility and blame. However, the problem is with having a dog in the first place or at all, not with how well someone trains a dog or not. That is only a piece of it. And it doesn't address the fact that such measures as training and containment are far from foolproof. See, there's a very simple way to counter the entire blame the owner, not the dog distraction that we constantly get. All you have to do in order to identify the actual, direct, identifiable source of all dog-related issues is imagine for a second a world where dogs completely vanish from one day to the next. In such a scenario, not a single person will ever utter the words, blame the owner, not the dog. When we're invoking terms like blame, what we're really talking about is the direct, identifiable source of something. For example, if a mosquito bites you, that is the direct cause of the bite, not the climate or some other external factor. Even imagining a scenario where a human is directly responsible for the presence of mosquitoes, at the end of the day, you still want to get rid of the mosquitoes themselves. After all, they are the ones running around and biting, even despite efforts by their breeders or owners to control them. Similarly, the thing to address and to remove from the equation with dogs is not the quality of their ownership, but their presence. After all, dogs constantly circumvent restraints and barriers, such as fences and leashes, as I will show towards the end, using lots of documentary proof that this very much happens. Those of us in the anti-dog community are very familiar with this phenomenon, and I am not the first to have pointed this glaring problem out by any means. But this is news to dog defenders everywhere, because there is still a prevailing attitude in the dog world that such weak measures are effective enough. If this were not the case, dogs would be outlawed, or it would be very illegal to ever have a dog outside an owner's property. Preferably, dogs would only ever be in a secure enclosure, similar to tigers. It would be illegal to have a dog anywhere outside the dog owner's private property, which would include on a leash. Or, leashes would be improved, and only very small dogs would be permitted to be walked on leashes. This is just an example. All dogs on leashes would also be required to wear muzzles while in public at all times, and there would be far better requirements for fences on properties where dogs are present. Fences would have to be much higher, and it would need to be made impossible for a dog to dig out from underneath or scale the top of the fence. Coyote rollers or other devices would be required by law on all fences. Some fences would be electrified fences, like in the case of properties with pit bulls, as these dogs are notoriously tenacious and determined to attack. I don't want to hear about your freedom to impose on others. Similar to the adage, the right to swing my fist ends where the other man's nose begins. Your dog's freedom to move about in the world ends quite a distance away from where our bodies are. Of course, a dog's barking even crosses property lines and is its own issue and something which by itself is reason enough to outlaw dog ownership. But I have already covered this. Before explaining why the idea of dogs used for personal protection or for the protection of property is inherently flawed, a few important things need to be highlighted. Bringing up things humans do when the topic is dogs, that is a logical fallacy. It's a red herring, 
or sometimes an appeal to worse problems. A big part of the point I made in my last video on this topic is that dogs produce negative externalities. Alarm systems don't endanger others, and nor do they create noise pollution and pollution in general. A weapon and an alarm system and other basic security measures are just fine. And these don't come with the drawback of owning a vicious, fanged predator with a will of its own. You also don't have to feed an alarm system or constantly walk it and take it to get dewormed, vaccinated, and so on. Guns don't have a will of their own, but dogs do. That is what makes dogs more dangerous than an inanimate object. Dogs are basically obsolete farming equipment and are not a replacement for technology, which is constantly improving and breaking ground. The odds of being attacked by a dog in the U.S. are about 1 in 70 compared to the odds of being fatally shot by another human, which are about 1,060 in a million. So, here's the thing. This is something I have recently addressed, but it bears repeating. Having a dog for protection is like hiring a bodyguard who is liable to assault anyone at random, including many people who pose no threat to you whatsoever. You'd fire them in a heartbeat. It's like having an alarm system that constantly goes off with false starts and false alarms. The end result would be that you'd get rid of it because it would continually irritate the living hell out of you. Yet that same person will tolerate a dog's incessant barking or put the bloody dog in their backyard and ignore it somehow and impose the barking on all those around them. A dog also cannot distinguish between a trespasser and a visitor or a worker who has fallen in through the roof. A dog will just attack anything it perceives as an enemy and will do so on sight. Hell, a dog will leave its fenced-in territory if the opportunity presents itself in order to launch an unprovoked attack against an animal, such as a neighborhood cat, a wild animal, or another dog. Or the dog may attack a wandering child or a casual jogger, or the mailman, or really anything it decides to attack. Dogs have no discernment. And even if dogs did function somewhat as their defenders say, example given, protecting persons and property, it is only in an incidental and rather indirect way. It works similar to how even a broken clock is right twice a day. Moreover, having an ill-tempered, violent, and massive dog you know will tear an intruder to shreds in your yard or in the home is the same thing as having a particularly nasty booby trap set up in your house, on your property. Legally speaking, you are well within your rights to defend yourself from an intruder who breaks in. However, under the law, at least in the United States, it is illegal to set up booby traps in advance. Yet dogs are an exception to this, in one of the biggest dog nutter countries out there. Back to the point about freedom, dogs don't even deserve rights. They certainly shouldn't be granted the same freedom to roam freely as humans. This is actually recognized and fairly well established today under the law as evidenced by leash laws and the common practice of keeping dogs in houses or behind gates and fences. However, increasingly, dog nutters everywhere are completely disregarding leash laws, and most fences are actually not a great measure against attacking dogs. The only reason more dogs aren't escaping to attack is because they are too dumb to realize that in many cases, they are physically capable of scaling or jumping the gates and fences they are often contained behind. It seems these dumb, pathetic creatures prefer to bark menacingly while pacing behind a fence. Nevertheless, dogs do get out, and this happens all the time. And finally, dogs do these sorts of things, like dig under or hop over fences to get out and attack, despite their owner's wishes. Dogs have their own drives and motivations, and these are external to those of their owners. The dog is equally to blame and is, again, the direct and immediately identifiable source of a dog attack. After all, we call it what it is, a dog attack, not a dog owner attack. Listen up, nutters, and listen good. You may find this shocking, but there are people out there who don't wish to be approached by any dog for any reason. We don't care if you falsely believe it's saying hi. It doesn't matter if you have all the confidence in the world that your dog won't bite. And finally, you shouldn't operate under the assumption that everyone else is a dog person like yourself. Dogs make people uncomfortable. And even in the best case scenario, they'll dirty our clothes or scratch our skin with their nasty, soiled paws when they pounce on us, or get snot, or other nose effluvia on us when they sniff us. But your dog could also take a chunk out of us, or far worse, it's not something we ever consented to. Leashes exist for a reason. Use them, and you damn well better make it short. Period!
I ended my last video by saying, leashes exist for a reason, use them. But here is the thing. And I did cover this previously. While a dog on a leash is better than one that is not restrained at all, it's still just a stopgap. A stopgap is something that serves a purpose for a short time, but is replaced as soon as possible. Ultimately, it is better for dogs to not be a thing at all. The fact that dogs need to be restrained in some manner is an indictment of their ownership. And here's the thing. Leashes are functionally useless most of the time, and for a few key reasons. Reason number one. For starters, people don't even use them half the time. It's the most impenetrable lock on the market today. It has only one design flaw. The door <laughs> must be closed! <laughs> of course, leashes have another design flaw. Many are entirely too long, like those crazy retractable leashes you see, some of which can be 24 feet long or 7.3 meters. If you are anywhere near others, having a dog on anything other than a very short leash is the functional equivalent of not having them on a leash at all. Another major issue with leashes is that many dogs are large and powerful enough to pull on them with so much force that they can literally drag their owners across the ground in pursuit of prey. A strap or a cord attached to a dog only provides the illusion of control. Eighty-eight-pound pit hopping over a five-foot fence. Come on, Bruno. Let's go. Wanna come? Come on. Jump. Jump. Come on. Go.